shears, curves, uh, cats polynomials, and the number of stable Higgs bundles. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks to Kevin and David and all the other organizers. Uh, what I want to talk about is related to this geometric or categorical Langlands correspondence in the sense that the objects which I'm interested in naturally arise there. Uh, but I'm interested in them for their own sake. I hope I can convince you that they're interesting also outside of this context of the geometric Langlands. But let me start by um, explaining the position uh, in the geometric Langlands in categorical uh, Langlands correspondence. So very conveniently for me, most of what I need was explained this morning. Uh, so let me start with x, a smooth projective curve over C. And I will take a pair of dual Langlands group, G, G check, Langlands dual uh, groups, reductive groups. And really, for most of my talk, uh, the objects arise when G is equal to G check is GLR. So it makes uh, no big difference to restrict ourselves to this situation. And, uh, well, the, the rough form, rough form of this categorical uh, Langlands <coughs> correspondence which was uh, first stated by uh, Bailinson and Rinfeld and then made precise by Arinkin and Gates-Gorey, says that there is an, should be an equivalence of categories between O modules on the moduli stack of G-check local systems on our curve and a category of D modules on the moduli stack of G bundles on the curve, and the original uh, geometric Langlands correspondence uh, went like this. If you take E, an irreducible uh, local system, so G-check local system on X, then to this you can associate the skyscraper sheaf at E, as Ed Frankel explained, and then this should be mapped by this categorical Langlands correspondence to uh, the corresponding D module, this automorphic uh, D module, which is denoted by ot E. Okay, so, um, so you can also ask uh, what happens when you take a reducible local system rather than an irreducible local system, or you can ask about uh, skyscraper sheaves uh, supported on singular points. It's the same thing. Or you can also ask about more general skyscraper, more general torsion sheaves. So natural question is, uh, what about more general torsion sheaves on lock? G check of X, and so the, the most singular point corresponds to the trivial local system. So the most singular point is, uh, say, E is the trivial local system, trivial local system. And so according to this uh, categorical Langlands correspondence, if you consider the O modules supported on this trivial local system, they should correspond to a certain category of D modules, of D modules. Maybe some of them correspond to actual perverse sheaves. And you can try to identify uh, this category. And you can also hope that the structure of this category, uh, if you understand it well, then you can maybe also understand torsion sheaf support at less singular points and maybe uh, arbitrary torsion sheaves this way. Uh, okay, so this is um, 
a little bit complicated, you can reduce a little bit the complexity here by using one property that was not mentioned this morning, one expected property of this categorical Langlands correspondence is um, the fact that well, there exists some uh, parabolic induction functors So I will be imprecise, a bit inaccurate here, because it's complicated uh, techniques, which uh, for part of it I don't uh, master on one side. But there exist parabolic induction functors um, on both sides. So if I pick uh, a parabolic, oops, maybe I'll start with this one. I pick a parabolic subgroup, parabolic and Levy subgroup, parabolic subgroup, and Levy factor. This corresponds to certain nodes of the Dinkin diagram. So there's a similar picture here. Then uh, from these, these induce uh, uh, maps, if you want, from uh, lock L check, lock P check, lock T check, and similarly for the bun, bun P check goes to bun G check goes to bun uh, L. This corresponds to choosing a filtration, if you want, in the GLR case a filtration of your vector bundle or your vector bundle with a flat connection, and then uh, taking the associated graded. And so these maps, they induce, well, let me go here, they induce, and this is the complicated part, uh, inducing some uh, functors from uh, O module uh, lock L check uh, X to and back from O module lock G check and similar uh, for the uh, automorphic side D module lock oops bun L check to and from uh, D module bun G, this is L. And this equivalence is supposed to be uh, compatible with such operations. Um, so on the D module side, this corresponds to the functor of Eisenstein series and constant term. And on the uh, uh, spectral side, I don't quite know the names. Um, Okay, and maybe more manageable than the whole category of O modules on this support that the trivial local system, one could start from the torus and see whatever we get by inducing. So more manageable. Uh, categories would be you start from, uh, consider subcategories. Uh, generated, so triangulated subcategories, generated by, um, oops, O module on the trivial local system from the torus, and uh, D module, um, and sorry, and the constant. and the constant sheath on bun t. OK, so uh, when you have a torus, you have very few uh, O modules, as was explained this morning. And they more or less correspond to uh, the connected components of this bun t. And the constant sheath of the bun t uh, generates for you a certain subcategory of the category of D modules. So let me make this a little bit more precise on this side, just to say something precise. Uh, 
here. So uh, here we take G is G L N G L R. And so if you look at bun, uh, if you look at this induction process, you start from the constant sheaf on bun L, you pull back to the constant sheaf, sorry, on bun T, you pull back to the constant sheaf on bun B, and then you want to map to the to bun G. This is bun G. And so what you have to do is you have to consider, you're supposed to consider bun B X and the projection to bun G X. And you have to take uh, the direct image of the constant sheaf here. Unfortunately, this map is not proper. Uh, but in the case of GLR, you can uh, make things a bit easier by embedding this as an open sub stack in the stack of, uh, let me write it like this. It's usually denoted, well, let me write it like this. Uh, core B of X. And this is the stack of all coherent sheaves equipped with the filtration by uh, coherent sub sheaves. But these may degenerate at some point. And this is also an open sub stack in the stack of all coherent sheaves. Uh, let me do it like this. This means coherent sheaves of rank R on X. And here you have this map, say, pi prime. And uh, so pi is not proper, but pi prime is. And so you can consider the, uh, let me denote by I's for Eisenstein series, uh, I's G of X. This is the uh, subcategory. Actually, uh, here you will land in perverse sheaves because this is a, a constant sheaf. Um, so constructible category. This is a subcategory uh, generated. Yeah. Generated. by uh, the push forward of the constant sheaf on core G X. So uh, this is a semi-simple complex. And so if you decompose it, uh, you can decompose it as a direct sum of uh, irreducible perverse sheaves on uh, core G X. You can reduce them, you can restrict them to uh, the open substack if you want. And then you can try to understand the category generated by all these sheaves. OK, and, and this is precisely the category which uh, I'm interested in. And so, uh, where? Here? Co oh, thank you. P prime, thank you. Uh, OK. So one thing that you can do with all these induction functors is, and which is uh, specific to GLR, is you can uh, consider the direct sum over all GLRs. And using the induction and restriction functors, uh, you have some nice operation on this uh, direct sum. So you see that you have functors uh, from I's GL, say, N plus M, coming from the parabolic induction uh, to and from I's GLN cross I's GLM. And, and these induce uh, uh, the structure, a structure of a uh, Hopf algebra, almost Hopf algebra, so I'm not completely precise here, on uh, the direct sum for all R, all N, of the Grothendieck group of this category. OK. So you can either consider the category itself, which is, the, of course, the nicest thing that you would want to do. Uh, but you can also just restrict and try to understand the Grothendieck group of this category. And so the observation for some curves of low genus and the hope in, in the general is that these categories are interesting, not only because they arise 
in this very uh, special area in this categorical Langlands program, but also for, for other reasons. Uh, so let me write it as a hope slash observation is that uh, these categories, so I's GL N, presumably you can study it for an arbitrary group, um, and their Crotendy groups uh, have a rich structure, rich and, and very rigid structure, and can be described in some uh, combinatorial terms. Uh, and so this could be interesting in several areas. Uh, so the combinatorics that arises here is very similar to combinatorics in infinite dimensional quantum groups. such as quantum affine algebras or quantum toroidal algebras or some double affine Hecke algebras. And it's also interesting in combinatorics. Here of McDonald polynomials, for instance, and also in knot theory, and also in some other areas of representation theory. I don't know. I never thought about it. But, uh, um, OK. So let me make a quick analogy with uh, things that uh, Victor was talking about, namely uh, quivers. So in the case of quivers, this construction uh, has been around for uh, 20 years, almost 25 years and is, is essentially due to Lustig analogy with quivers. So as Victor explained, uh, quivers and curves have a very uh, important common property that they are categories of global dimension one. So the moduli stack of objects is smooth, and, um, and so there's a, a very nice and fruitful an analogy between the two. So in this case, so you take Q, a quiver, and you can take uh, D, a dimension vector, I think Victor used alpha, but. and so, well, bun GL, bun or koch would be a better analogy, uh, G on X. This is replaced by the moduli stack of representation oops, of your quiver. And this category of Eisenstein, uh, Eisenstein sheaves, this is a certain uh, category denoted by QD, category of perverse sheaves. Uh, which was introduced by Lustig. I don't know what's happening. Introduced. by Lustig, and this is strongly related to the theory of canonical basis. And, um, and so this is really a, a whole area of uh, representation theory. And the growth and the groups of these categories are uh, Hopf algebras again, if you take the sum over all dimension vectors. You take the direct sum over all dimension vectors of k0, well, say k0 of i's g and n. This is a direct sum over all dimension vectors of k0 of this category. And by a theorem uh, uh, due to Lustig and Ringel, this is the positive half of a quantum uh, enveloping algebra of a Katsmudi algebra associated to uh, the quiver. So this is a Katsmudi 
algebra associated to the quiver Q. So there is a lot of uh, representation theory arising here, and uh, the expectation is that there are similar nice quantum groups arising in, in the case of uh, a curve. And in the low genus, you can, you can check this. In the high genus, uh, it's not very well known. And there is one more theorem which I want to state, uh, which is more recent, and which is uh, related to a lot of interesting research going on. Uh, it's theorem due to Varagnolo and Vassro, which says the following. Um, if you take the X algebra, of the direct sum for all simple perverse sheaves uh, arising in the, this is still in the context of quivers. Or P, uh, where P runs among simple objects in Q D. So you fix a quiver Q and a dimension vector D, and you look at the X algebra. So this contains essentially the, the knowledge of the category itself. Then this is isomorphic to the so-called uh, kovanov lauda rukie algebra. I don't remember the notation. A, Q, D. And so there's an explicit presentation the point is that there is an explicit presentation for this X algebra, and this is a really uh, important fundamental tool in the theory of categorification. So it seems like an interesting problem to compute this X algebra in the case of curves as well. Okay, so what do I want to do? This was just uh, to explain the position of of these uh, algebras in this geometric Langlands uh, program. But now let me briefly state what I want to do in these lectures. So I don't really want to talk about the Langlands correspondence, but rather give some nice application of, uh, of these uh, algebras. So uh, aim is use say the combinatorics of, let me write like this, actually I will use a, a simpler minded version of this algebra, which is not defined using perverse sheaves, um, to compute uh, two things which are uh, st very strongly related. One of them is the cohomology, so the Poincaré polynomial of the moduli space of stable Higgs bundles. On a curve X over C. So I will define what is the uh, Higgs bundle and the moduli space of stable Higgs bundles. And um, something which is, let's say, a bit stronger, which implies um, the knowledge of this cohomology, is the number of points uh, over FQ. Let me give a name. Moduli space of stable Higgs bundles. Uh, Higgs stable. X, well, X over C. And uh, you can compute the number of points of the moduli space of stable Higgs bundles for x over a finite field. And somehow all the structure, the, the, the answer um, is given in terms of some, something in this algebra, some pairing in this algebra. And the structure constants for this algebra uh, only depend on uh, I will be a bit vague on the motive of the curve. And so um, 
So there's a, uh, this, this category is built out of the motive of the curve. And uh, it will show in this uh, computation. Okay. So the aim for the rest of today's lecture is to uh, say a few things about moduli spaces, moduli stacks of uh, coherent sheaves or vector bundles or, and uh, Higgs bundles, and then to um, state the, the theorem. Maybe not give the formula. Maybe that will be uh, for tomorrow, but okay. Okay, so now I will try to be a bit more uh, precise and start with a bunch of, a few definitions. Um, so some facts about uh, vector bundles and Higgs bundles on the curves. So we let so we let x be as before, smooth projective curve over field k, and k can be c, can also be f q, can be f q bar, and uh, so let me just write again coherent sheaves on x. This is an abelian category of global dimension equal to one. And uh, let me give it just some, some notation uh, for F. And coherent sheaf on X, uh, I can consider its rank and its degree. And so I will put a class of F is the rank of f, is the pair rank of f, degree of f. This is an element in z2, only is in half of z2. But. Okay, and as in Victor's talk, there's an important uh, numerical invariant here, which is the Euler form, which can be easily computed and only depends on the classes of the sheaves. So usually the Euler form uh, descends to the Grothendieck group. In this case, it descends to a larger quotient of the Grothendieck group. We only keep the discrete part of the Grothendieck group, if you want. So the Euler form, which is defined, oops, defined to be the dimension of the hom minus the dimension of the x. This is equal to by uh, Riemann Roch. Riemann Roch. This is equal to the following uh, formula: one minus g. G is the genus of the curve. Uh, one minus g times the rank of f, rank of g, plus rank of f, degree of g minus rank of g, degree of f. So this is an important numerical invariant. And uh, we can consider the moduli stack burn Rd. So I fix the discrete invariant R and D. And I consider the moduli stack, moduli stack of uh, coherent uh, vector bundles sorry, on X of class equal to R. And D, and uh, this is a smooth, as explained by Victor, this is a smooth stack. It is uh, locally a finite type, which I will explain in more detail in the next lecture. Locally a finite type, which means that uh, morally, uh, this can be covered by open substacks, and these open substacks have a nice property. Um, that they are stacks of finite type, and even better, they're a quotient of smooth algebraic varieties of finite type by some reductive group. So you can approximate it by 
quotients of this type. And this is uh, connected and of dimension equal to minus the Euler form, this is a general fact. And in this case, it is g minus 1 r squared. Uh, okay. So, what do we know about this stack? This is too big. Uh, as I said, it's smooth, finite. It's a smooth locally of finite type. And uh, it's possible to define its cohomology. And there are some classical theorems which uh, compute this cohomology. So let me state these theorems. Uh, so we're interested in the cohomology. So first thing, let's look at the cohomology of an RD with complex coefficients, a rational coefficient. And um, so this cohomology is, is very nicely generated as a ring by some tautological classes. This is a common uh, phenomenon in modular space of uh, things. So uh, let E be the universal uh, bundle on the product uh, X cross bun R D. Uh, in other words, well, you have to prove the existence of such a universal bundle, but uh, it comes from the construction or uh, yeah, construction of the stack, uh, which means that when you restrict E to X times a point, let me be a little bit vague in the notation, a point E corresponding to a certain vector bundle um, on X, then this is E. Okay. Um, so you have this very nice universal bundle, and you can take its churn classes. Uh, so you can take the churn classes of this universal bundle, and this lives in the cohomology of X cross uh, bun RD, and this you can decompose as the cohomology of X tensor, the cohomology of bun RD. And you can pick a basis in this cohomology of X. And then uh, you can look at the components. You can decompose these churn classes according to the components. And you get a bunch of churn classes, a bunch of elements in the cohomology of bun RD this way. And then the theorem says that they freely generate as a super commutative algebra, they freely generate the cohomology ring. So this gives you a, a very good grip on this cohomology ring, in particular the Poincaré polynomial can be computed from that. So let me uh, write this, uh, set ci epsilon class of x tensor ai, just notation. I'm going to define some classes in the cohomology, ai, then the sum, 1 to 2 g, gamma j, tensor b, ij, plus class of a point, tensor fi, where ai, bij, and fi belong to the cohomology of bun. Rd, and the magic um, is a theorem, which I think is uh, uh, due to, I think it's usually attributed to Atia and Bot. I think a part of this was uh, proved by Harder and Narasimhan before that. It says simply that the cohomology ring is a free supercommutative algebra generated by these classes. A i, uh, b i j, f i, where i goes from 1 to r. 
because this is a rank R uh, vector bundle, so all the next term classes vanish. Um, okay. So this is, uh, as I said, you can use this to uh, write a formula for the Poincaré polynomial of the moduli stack of all uh, rank R and fixed degree vector bundles. And you can also do something which is strongly related, uh, which is now consider the curve uh, over a finite field and count the number of points in this stack. This is a other natural thing to do. Point count, so now you choose x to be finite field fq, and the set of fq rational points on bun rd, this is a groupoid, this is because this is a stack and not a algebraic variety, the set of rational points is a groupoid. And the automorphism of a point is just the automorphism of the corresponding vector bundle. And so you can try to, so you define the volume of bun rd, let's say fq, to be the sum over all vector bundles, v, in bun rd up to isomorphism of, uh, you have to take into account the uh, group of automorphism of each point. That's how you count the volume of orbifolds. And so you divide by the number of automorphism of v. So this is the definition of the volume. And there is a beautiful theorem, which is due to Harder, which is known as the Siegel formula, and which was also mentioned, uh, which also appeared in uh, the talk by Tom Hales this morning when he talked about Tamagawa number. It's related to this. So uh, let me first introduce the zeta function of x. What is the zeta function? Well, there are some better ways to define it, but I'll just throw the formula at you. Uh, zeta function is this following rational function divided by 1 minus z, 1 minus qz. And here alpha 1 up to alpha 2g are the Frobenius eigenvalues in H1 of the curve. So the etal cohomology of the curve over uh, uh, algebraic closure. Uh, also known as the veil numbers. Of x, and as I'm sure many people know here, we can also define the zeta function as the generating function for the number of points in the symmetric product of the curve. Uh, over a number of points over fq. And so using this I can state this uh, theorem of Halder. And it's based on previous work of Siegel. And this morning, Tom Hales attributed this to Langlands in, the, in that setting. So probably uh, Langlands is probably in between Siegel and Harder. So it gives a precise formula. So first of all, what's not obvious, this is an infinite sum. It's not obvious that this sum converges. But it actually does. And here's the theorem, so the volume. And Rd is, there is a power of Q uh, there is the minimal group of automorphism everybody has at least uh, scalars as automorphisms and then you have the number of points in the Jacobian of X over FQ okay. the number of points in the variety not the stack and here you have a very nice product of zeta functions. Zeta of x q bar minus i. So this volume is given by some nice product of zeta function. It only depends on the veil numbers of the curve. And there is, I'm sure I don't have time. I don't think I have time to 
uh, state it, but there is a um, motivic version of this theorem. Uh, if you consider motives in the sense of the Grothendieck group of varieties, uh, then you can uh, essentially cut, cut and paste Ben RD. And, you know, so you can cut Ben RD and glue it back together in a different way in order to obtain um, an analog of this, but uh, motivically, where here, instead of the zeta function, you would replace by what I said previously, the generating function for the symmetric product of the curve. And this is the motif of the Jacobian. Okay, so there's a, a theorem like this, which is due to Berend and Dillon a few years ago. Okay, and so, well, uh, it's not surprising that there is a relation between the point count. If you do the work of writing the generating function, the Poincaré polynomial of this uh, stack, uh, using the fact that this is a free supercommutative algebra, you see that you have R factors, and uh, these factors have a 1 minus uh, Z, 1 minus T for every uh, J. So this accounts for the uh, numerator in this product of zeta functions. But uh, there is a weight. So Bij uh, is of uh, weight uh, 2i minus 1. So this accounts for the shift in the power of Q. Q is T square in the Poincaré polynomial here. And the ai and the fi appear in the denominator because these are commutative variables, even variables, and this accounts for, for the rest of the terms. Okay. So as I said, there is a relation, and the relation explained is explained by the following theorem of, uh, it may have been known before, but at least I found it, and also in the case of modular space of G bundles, so there is a purity theorem for the cohomology of the stack of, of vector bundles. So let me mention that. Um, so relation between cohomology and volume I'll just state the theorem, which is maybe known before, but at least I found it in a nice paper, in more generality, in a nice paper by Heinlatt and Schmidt, which says that uh, the cohomology of Bun Rd is pure. So you take x over some finite field, and uh, then you can consider uh, the Frobenius acting here. And uh, uh, purity is that the Frobenius, uh, the, the weight is uh, given by the, the degree, cohomological degree. OK. And so you have three statements here. And uh, you can deduce uh, two of the statements from the third one if you work a little bit. OK. Um, so now uh, I have to, you have to make some kind of leap of faith in this geometric Langlands program. We're interested in the moduli stack. But for other reasons, one might be interested in the moduli space of the actual uh, algebraic variety parameterizing vector bundles. So in order to get an algebraic variety, you have to restrict yourself to uh, semi-stable or stable bundles. And although, as Dima pointed out, uh, this is maybe not very relevant to the geometric Langlands program, it's still an interesting algebraic variety. It was studied before the moduli stack. And uh, so I want to explain how to use the hardan nahasim infiltration in order to deduce from these the cohomology of this moduli space of stable, Higgs uh, stable vector bundles. So I'll try to do this uh, quickly. So first, I have to define what is a semi-stable vector bundle. So 
so semi stable bundle uh, so let's just define the slope of a uh, vector bundle uh, as the quotient of the degree by the rank this is a rational number and you say that f is semi-stable if any subsheaf of f has a smaller slope in the broad sense than f. And uh, I don't really have time to go into details, but um, you can consider the, the moduli, the say you can consider the substack of bun r d corresponding to semi-stables. And this is an open substack in the moduli space, in the moduli stack of all bundles. And this one admits a coarse moduli space, so an actual variety which satisfies some natural universality uh, property. Let me denote it by uh, M R D. And so this is the moduli space now of uh, semi stable vector bundles. And it's known to be singular in general, but projective. Now, there is one particular nice case when R and D are relatively prime. In this case, uh, semi-stable coincides with stable. Stable means that you have a strict inequality here. And uh, it's always the case that the open subset of the semi-stable corresponding to stables is smooth. So when they both coincide, in the co-prime case, this is actually a smooth projective variety. So there is a very nice uh, induction, recurrence, which you can use to compute the cohomology of this moduli space, which I'll try to uh, uh, briefly describe. How then our Seaman filtration. Let me check how much time I have. Oh, I still have 15 minutes, right? Almost. Okay. Maybe I've been rushing like a madman. Okay, you should stop me if you think I'm going too fast. Um, okay, so what is the Howland Arasim infiltration? It's based on the following fact. Uh, for any vector bundle, here I mean for any vector bundle, there exists a unique filtration, which is called the Hal Naha Siemens filtration. Um, let me write it like this. So it's a filtration by uh, subbundles, such that um, so each quotient, each factor, so vi divide by vi minus, wait a minute, vi divided by vi plus one is semi-stable. And uh, the slope is uh, ordered in increasing order, strictly increasing. So let me make sure that I got it right. Vs, this is the semi-stable. Vs has to be semi-stable at the maximal slope. So it's fine, okay. So the, the existence and unicity of this is actually very easy to prove in the case of vector bundles. And uh, why is this useful? Because it allows you to break up every uh, vector bundle as uh, some extension a unique way as an extension of semi-stables. And what this means geometrically is the following. It means that you have a partition of your moduli stack 
And each part of this moduli stack you can uh, describe in terms of semi-stable bundles of lower rank. And this is how you get the uh, recurrence to uh, construct these moduli spaces of stable or semi-stable bundles from the moduli stack of bundles. So, so this gives a partition of bun R D as a disjoint union over all types. Let me put them like this, H. So maybe here I should say that uh, definition, uh, the type of V is the collection of all the classes. So it's V1 modulo V2, and in the end it's Vs. So you have a bunch of classes, and uh, you can partition your moduli stack according to these classes, and uh, you have a natural map from H and alpha, which uh, now can be described as a stack parameterizing extensions of uh, semi-stable bundles. You have a natural uh, map to uh, the graded, the associated graded. So this maps to the product, Koch alpha one, oops, bun, bun, ah, semi-stable alpha one, bun, semi-stable alpha s. And this map is what is called a uh, stack vector bundle. So the fiber may have automorphisms, but um, uh, so th this looks like the quotient of a certain vector bundle over this stack by the action of another vector bundle over this stack. So it, it behaves like an affine morphism in the sense that the fibers are affine, affine fibration. And you can uh, therefore study the cohomology of the number of points in this stratum from what is known over the semi-stable part. So this is an important but not terribly difficult uh, result. And so this allows you to, um, how to say this, to compute, to recursively compute say the volume of semi-stable bundles or actually the cohomology of the stack, uh, uh, the cohomology of, of the actual moduli space. Uh, well, let me still write that. So there is some work to do because uh, here you have a decomposition of this bundle into pieces and you know the cohomology of each piece. You need to uh, show that the long exact sequence that allows you to relate the cohomology of one and the other splits. This is not, not obvious, but uh, this can be done. And here let me give a reference. Very nice set of lectures by Jochen Heinlott. Called uh, it contains the word coma. It contains the word moduli stack of vector bundles. Maybe cohomology of the moduli stack of vector bundles of bun G. No, I, I don't remember vector bundles on curves. Anyway, it's rather recent. Very nice lectures. Uh, okay, and just one remark. This allows you to compute. This as a vector space, as a ring, it's still it's a difficult problem. I think it's still unknown. It's a quotient of the cohomology ring of the of bun, but there are lots of relations which are uh, difficult to get a hold on. Okay, so this is about the whole story. We know a lot, almost everything from this point of view. 
for uh, vector bundles, moduli stacks and moduli spaces of vector bundles on curves. Now we're interested in uh, Higgs bundles. So let me quickly define Higgs bundles. and state the problem. So now we move to Higgs bundles. So let me first define the stack of Higgs bundles. This is easy. So the stack of Higgs bundles run R and degree D. This is the cotangent bundle to the stack of vector bundles of rank R and degree D. But this uh, nice notation hides some complicated facts. So in the, in the, not the next lecture, but the third one, I will actually go through quickly the construction of this as a stack using the standard construction of quote schemes and so on. And then give the construction of this moduli stack of Higgs bundles using what uh, Victor was explaining, uh, namely this uh, Hamiltonian reduction process. Uh, but maybe heuristically, let me say that Higgs, so the, 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 the tangent space at the vector bundle E to bun Rd, this is the x to 1 of E with itself. This is a deformation space of the vector bundle. Um, and, and so the cotangent bundle This is the dual and by ser duality this is canonically isomorphic to the set of maps from E to E tensor the canonical line bundle on your curve and so the moduli stack of Higgs bundles parameterizes pairs given by a vector bundle and such a, a map so Higgs R D is let me say the set of uh, pairs F theta, where F is in bun R D, and theta, the so-called Higgs field, is the map from E uh, F to F tensor omega. Okay, and this is this is a singular stack. One way to see that this is singular is, again, as Victor explained, uh, this is the moduli stack of objects in some category, category of, of Higgs bundles, or coherent sheaves, sheaves uh, Higgs sheaves. And this is the category of global dimension 2. So it's not smooth. OK, and I have minus some minutes. No, not yet. Um, so the problem is to compute the number of points uh, not of this Higgs bundle, this is infinite. The number of points in this stack of Higgs bundles is infinite. Um, and the cohomology is also infinite. So, um, but you can still define a very nice, even nicer than uh, the, set, the moduli space of stable vector bundles. You can define the moduli space of stable Higgs bundles. And uh, this has a cohomology. And well, let me, let me write this quickly. So let me, I'll be a bit, a bit more precise later on, but I'm running out of time. There is a, a nice moduli space. which is smooth. Uh, let's, let's just assume that the GCD of R and D is 1. So stable and semi-stable are the same. So you have a nice, smooth uh, moduli, uh, moduli space. And it has a, it's equipped with a map to some affine space, which is the so-called Hitchin map. I forgot to say this is a symplectic variety. And this is a Lagrangian vibration in the sense that uh, 
fibers are Lagrangian, Lagrangian sub-varieties, Lagrangian vibration, and this is a completely integrable system, which uh, motivates the study of this moduli space for its own sake. So the problem is uh, compute uh, the cohomology and also the volume, say the number of points. Now it's just a just a, a variety over a finite field. You can define over a finite field. So let me finish, if I have one minute, by stating a slightly unprecise form of the theorem, which I will spend the next two lectures proving. Um, before that, I need very quickly a definition. So let us fix some genus. And let me denote by uh, Tg is morally the set of all possible values for the veil numbers. So Z1 up to Z2G in Gm R2G, such that uh, Z2I minus 1, Z2I is equal to Z2J minus 1, Z2J for any I in J. This is the torus, torus in GSP2G. Here you should think of. Uh, GSP2G acting on the cohomology on H1 of the curve. And there's a vial group, which is isomorphic to semi-direct product of the symmetric group SG and S2G times, which permutes pairs. So they come into pairs, like the veil numbers come into pairs. And this number of points is not going to be a polynomial in Q because there's a motive of the curve in this picture, but it's going to be as close as possible, it only depends on uh, the Frobenius eigenvalues. And one way to state it is to say that uh, for any curve x, well, for any finite field, for any x over fq of genus g, you have, a, a sig you have an associated point, sigma x, in the quotient tg modulo wg which is simply the veil numbers, the set of veil numbers. This is the point. So this quotient space is my uh, limited version of the moduli space of curves of genus G over some finite field. But that's enough. And so now I can state the theorem and finish there. So you fix G, uh, and also you fix R and D. Uh, so there exists a unique polynomial, A, G, R, D, and you assume, let's assume that G, C, D of R, D is equal to 1. So there is a unique polynomial, uh, which is actually with positive coefficients. What is it? it belongs to the image inside, uh, let's say, Q of Tg Wg. So this is closest I can do to a polynomial, but it has positive coefficients such that for any x, for any fq, and any x of genus G, the number of points of the stable Higgs bundle uh, oops, sorry, is equal to, there is a power of q the way I stated it, uh, times the number of stable Higgs bundles of rank r in degree d over fq for x. And this is the first result. And then there is an analogous result for the Poincaré polynomial, 
over C. And then the third result, and this is in spirit very closely related to what Victor explained at the end of his lecture, uh, this number AGRD is actually the number, well, when you evaluate it at sigma x, this is the number of absolutely indecomposable vector bundles on x of rank r and degree d. So it means that, the, first of all, the number of indecomposable vector bundles on a curve, if you fix the rank and the degree, this is given by some explicit, I will not give the formula now, but it's given by some explicit uh, uh, expression in the veil numbers of the curve. It's actually most likely given by the character of a certain representation of the group, which makes a lot of sense if you think that everything should be built out of the motive of the curve. Um, and, and also it gives the number of points in this Higgs moduli space. Okay, I've run out of time, sorry. <laughs>